pray that you would bless this time, Lord. We pray that you would fill up this space, God. We pray that you would just unite us in your spirit. God, we pray for your anointing to come upon us. We take authority over every spirit that's not of God. We take authority over hindering spirits and over anything and everything that would try to affect this time in this space. God, we pray that you would bless this training, Lord. We pray that it would be really good, really blessed, and really fruitful in our lives. God, we pray that you would help us all to, to be quickened, made alive, and to be filled, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would sharpen our minds right now. Yes. Lord, I pray that you would sharpen my mind too, and that this would be a blessed time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today's uh, topic is going to be divine appointments. And we're going to look at what are they? So very often a divine appointment, when we use that word, not that God isn't in charge of all ministry encounters with everybody and every situation, but you could almost say that divine appointment is a classification, maybe even just in our vernacular, but I'd say in a lot of people's vernacular and figures of speech. And that's where it's really something God ordained. So right now I could go to uh, the walking path uh, or the park or um, the mall or anything really like that. And you know, you could go up to anybody there and just go person by person by person sharing the gospel. And it may not necessarily be God ordained. It's not going to be fruitless, but it's more like you're going and scattering seed where maybe a God ordained appointment is like where somebody has a hole dug already and a tree is going to be planted there. You know, it's just something, uh, a good maybe earthly analogy to kind of understand. So it's different than ministry encounters. Like when we go to the swap meet, when we go to the fair, um, there can be divine appointments at those places. But even though we're serving the Lord and he's called us to do that, doesn't mean every encounter you have is like a quote unquote divine appointment. So it's an intersection in somebody's life. Truthfully, there are times in people's lives where they, it's like they're on a road and really nothing's gonna get them off that road. And God hasn't even established in that moment that you're talking to them, uh, that they can get off the road that they're on. They can, everything that you're saying could be useful for when they do come to that place of intersection. Um, but there are just times where people are set on their kind of the wrong road and nothing you can say or do is gonna change that. So for example, the rich young ruler, he had a divine appointment with Jesus. Um, he came, but even what Jesus said didn't get him off the road as far as we know. Maybe in his future, we literally have no idea. Could he have ever followed Jesus? Um, scripture doesn't say. Uh, but if he did end up ever following Jesus after the crucifixion and the resurrection, you better believe that that encounter that he had with Jesus played a big role in, in that future choice. So that's speculation, but it's just an example um, of how encounters can play a role later in life. Other times, even people here, and we can see if um, anybody wants to share when we come to that spot of instances where you remember like you had a divine appointment in your life. So a divine appointment can often happen for someone right before something bad happens. So I know that sounds funny and odd, but it's true. Usually right before somebody's gonna have a major temptation towards sin, um, or another instance of a choice to stay in darkness, or um, even something physically bad happening, God will very often pop into people's lives. Now, to the extent that somebody's in total darkness, they may not see it. They may actually think like, um, while they're in it, God, God wasn't there. But God always has a way of bringing those type of things back. And divine appointments have a way of really uh, marking somebody's life different than just a sermon. And the reason why we can know that is, you know, people go into sermons all the time and um, maybe years later, they really come to Christ and they're never like, well, I remember this sermon. I remember that sermon. I remember all 150 sermons that I sat through for three years. They're like, I remember this one time where somebody challenged me on this one thing and I didn't listen. Well, or maybe it becomes they did listen. So it's important to understand the importance of what what's happening when God is setting up a divine appointment. They can also occur due to someone's recent openness to the Lord. So someone maybe recently started taking the Lord more seriously, 
Uh, they've recently prayed to ask God for help. We, we've encountered that a lot. Has anybody here um, have any quick stories that they'd like to share where you, you um, really felt like God was setting something up and the person then responds and says, you know, I actually recently started opening up my heart to Jesus. So I very recently actually prayed, you know, for the first time. Would anyone like to share one? That stands out? Okay, Andrew. Uh, Sullivan and I talked to someone at the park once who had just gotten in a fight with his uh, child's mother, and he was a younger guy, and he was like just at the park sitting and thinking, God, what is the purpose of life? What's the reason mm-hmm. for all this? And then we walked up to him. Wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I had one where it was actually during Winter Haven. A Christian couple came up and there was a woman with them and the woman was homosexual on the day before she had gotten into a very big fight with uh, her partner and it broke the relationship. She was planning on marrying this person and uh, it literally ended the relationship and she grew up as a, as a Christian, but I don't know her entire story. But from... Um, 13 on, she thought she had invited Jesus into her life. And that day, I was challenging her that she needed to repent of homosexuality and give that relationship to God. And I actually ran into her months later at the fair. And um, her confession to me was that she was still not in relationship and she was going to church with her um, brother and sister-in-law. And um, wow. so... I think it would have been a few months after. Yeah, it would have been... Uh, four, four to five months, four to five months later. And she you seemed different. She had like a totally different countenance. So those, that's the power of what God can do in a divine appointment with somebody. Um, everybody knows uh, Jose, correct? Jose, for, uh, the officer. Yeah. That was a divine encounter where I spoke to him at Fry's and... Um, he didn't really come to Christ then, but then uh, a few months later, other people were sent to him, into his life and he started opening his heart up to Jesus. So a lot a lot could be said for what a divine appointment is. And um, there's no way to know the full impact of obedience to, um, to God in these encounters. So what I mean by that is when you're obeying God in these encounters, you have no idea what, what can come of it. Like there can be just an immense um, level of fruit later on in somebody's life without you really knowing. So divine appointments are most likened to be uh, to being a vessel for the Holy Spirit. And so the thing that makes divine appointments different than other encounters is that oftentimes your other encounters, bless you, your other encounters can be longer term ministry assignments. So if we look at that work, it's harder to have divine appointments with people you work with. Now, God can set them up, but that becomes more of like ministry, divine ministry encounter. You know, somebody at work uh, gets a DUI and they're like, my life is over. Well, OK, perfect time to share the gospel with them. Somebody at work is like, my wife kicked me out of the house or my husband kicked me out of the house. OK, perfect opportunity to sweep in there. And God could be setting up the stage for them to have a totally transformed life. Um, But it's much harder because when you work with people, when you have family, friends and acquaintances, people learn to kind of have this defensive shield. And it's something that I think all of us have seen. People with familiarity um, seem to have a little bit more pushback. Mm -hmm. And even Jesus had that because when he went to his hometown, it says that he couldn't do many mighty works. And they kept saying, aren't you the son of Joseph, the carpenter? And Jesus had more difficulty ministering to the people that he maybe had worked for, worked with his family, childhood friends, and acquaintances that, that knew him. Um, and it's because people have a way of projecting who they want you to be when when they've known you for a while. And we do that as well with people. It's I'd say... It's just uh, something that we all kind of learn to do in life, but that hinders the ministry of God. So, for example, Jesus goes over to uh, a city that's never heard of him before. The people there are receptive. He's in his hometown. The people pretty much reject him. 
So a lot of ministry encounters deal with you having to go through someone's defenses. And that's why divine appointments are more, um, are more powerful. So we've all seen like war movies at some point in our life, I'm guessing, right? You know, the thing about um, defenses is that the best defenses are ones that are up because you know that the enemy is about to attack. So people have these defenses up. It's like, oh, I know that person knows God. Or I know that person believes in that Jesus stuff, so I'm going to, you know, put all my defenses in that direction when I'm with them. And when you have a divine appointment, it's kind of like that immediately is broken. They can catch people off guard. And there are surprise interventions by God into, into someone's life. So it's literally like God doing a surprise attack. Um, has anybody here? Now, I don't normally get too surprised especially anymore, but has anybody here had any interesting, not even God surprise stories, but just surprise stories where you're like, whoa, that caught me way off guard. Anybody? Awesome. Okay, share one. So the other night, like, so I, there's this guy that lives in my building on the other side, and I can see him walking by a lot, like to go to the Triple K and get stuff that... I never really felt led to talk to him until the other night when I was mm-hmm. walking my dog and I just felt like I should ask him, what do you think of Jesus? Mm-hmm. And he seemed really caught off guard by the question. He's like, this is so random. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I talked to him for like an hour and he's like, this is a really enlightening conversation. And he grew up Irish Catholic and I told him like, you know, like God's not about you just like doing all of the things to be accepted by him. I keep looking for the heart that acknowledges their sin and turns from their sin and turns to him. And he's like, huh. So like, he's like, this is a really enlightening conversation. So Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a good example. Approach. One that has nothing to do with spirituality, but there was a time I was walking back. From, um, there was a gym that was near the school I was going to in Texas, and I was walking back one night uh, from it. And... It was very dark out and there's no street lights in this neighborhood and it wasn't a dangerous place but i was just walking you know walking and out of nowhere um i started hearing barking like right next to me and so it was like a quick adrenaline rush and i was totally shocked and i'm thinking like i'm about to get bit and then um you know i pulled out my phone and had the flashlight and it was just a little tiny dog but it, it had a lot of bark but you know it really it really caught me off guard um, where, you know, if I had seen that little dog coming, I would have just been like, it's a little dog. I mean, it was just a tiny little dog, but it, it really only started barking right when it was next to me. So that was the thing that, that really threw me off. Yeah, sneak attack. But ministry with people can be very similar to what Summer said. There's times where if you just, um, you know, if you are feeling led by God to go up to somebody and ask them a question like that, their defenses are going to be way down. And I've even had it where in that moment, um, there's a lot more receptivity. And then over maybe the course of the conversation, it's like their defenses start to rise. Um, Where in the initial thing, they're like, whoa, I think God just just showed up. And then they're like, well, I don't really want God to show up in my life. Um, So why does God... Why does God do it like this? Well, he does it because um, it leaves it leaves an impact on the person. And that's more important than something um, just that they go through. You know, God isn't looking for us to minister for our sake. We're to minister for their sake. Humans are habitual. And what they expect, um, they can much e- more easily resist. So uh, I'll give you an example. You know, if somebody, if we were to even just do a demonstration or, you know, everybody here has probably seen sports, right? So somebody that gets blindsided in football gets really impacted. When they're bracing for the tackle, um, it's just a normal tackle. And the same thing can happen in people's lives with God. You know, people can kind of say, oh, I'm bracing against what God's about to do. Uh, There's this expression that humans are incredibly bad at reacting, um, but very good at predicting. So that's kind of what our brain does. Our brain, um, you know, we, it predicts that there's going to be 
ground there. We take a step and everything is happening in a very predictive, predictable manner. But you know, if I were to step like that and that were to be maybe nothing and my brain wasn't able to predict that, um, it has serious consequences. Well, that's something bad, but the same thing can occur in spiritual things. When people aren't reacting habitually um, to the gospel, but they're reacting um, kind of just in the moment and having to react to what's actually happening, God can get their attention in a way that's much more impactful. Um, so that's the importance of a divine appointment. Divine appointments really leave a clear mark in the person's life. Um, so would, was there a question? Before you, I thought you were telling uh, Barbara at the end. She just had an incident today. And she, whenever you want her, some people to share what they think is a divine point. Okay, so yeah, we can we can share some right now because we do have some. I was going to ask for examples. So you had a divine appointment today. Yeah, she. Had okay. I mean, you want to tell them. somebody saw her shirt. Uh huh. And they said they like the shirt, so there's the shoe on. Yeah. Because nobody who's not a Christian likes the shirt. Right. And it was uh, something about the Bible or something. Uh huh. It was an older guy. Yeah. And uh, we talked to him. I mean, he wasn't, and we asked him how he's doing, and he said he, he could be doing better, you know. And I don't know. I didn't get into it heavy with him. I, I tried to tell him, you know, pressing in and, live, you know, living for Jesus. They said, you ask him into your heart and change your heart and your desires. And he was, and I said to him, so what, did you grow up Catholic? And he said, yeah, but he had left the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. So it was kind of a divine appointment in that they didn't have any fellowship. You want to tell them? And Barbara gave him, Barbara, you know, invited him to come. Great. I just encouraged him. I said, you know, even, even if you're just in the park on a Sunday, come over and check it out. Or, if you know, whatever, we're there. Yeah. So, but um, he had definitely, he had a testimony that he truly believed in Jesus. So the divine appointment might have been where God was working in the things that he shared, mm -hmm. because I was kind of trying to nudge him into a more serious relationship with God, asking him yes. about fellowship, do you have fellowship? Mm -hmm. So it was a divine appointment, actually, if you stop to think about it, that in the course of the day, God has us walk by him while he's sitting there waiting for his wife to go through checkout and he sees the shirt. So yeah. what does it take to set all that up? Mm. Right. And yeah. so, you know, it was something that we, of course, gave him a track and went for his wife. And, yeah. And and we had a good uh -huh. connection. And no, he, he just said, you know, that that is something that I like. Mm -hmm. He says, but I have to work on my relationship with Jesus much more. Mm -hmm. And he says, do it. Because it's going to make me stronger. Mm -hmm. And you're going to enjoy life more. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Can anybody think of some divine appointments from their lives that were intersections where God was either trying to get your attention or where somebody, something really marked um, in your mind that it was a divine appointment? Does anybody want to share any examples of those? Yeah. Slavic. Last year, going to allowed COVID to happen, so I wouldn't fly to Ukraine because I got my plane ticket and I was going to fly. And then the COVID happened March 11th, 2020. Uh -huh. Completely transformed my whole life. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want COVID to happen. <laughs> I'd probably be Ukraine. Wow. I think that's the biggest one intervention I've had in the past 10 years. That, wow. And then when calling me around the world. And then have you come here. Come here. Yes. Right. Yeah. So in 2013, uh, so I've already been working in China for three years then, and I joined the performing group I was part of in college to do the European tour where we performed in 10 countries. And I really like Europe and I wanted to stay there. And I really wanted out of China, but I kept asking God, why do you keep bringing me back there? Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I felt like I was running away. But in Europe, almost every host because our group is pretty poor, so we need hosts to mm -hmm. let us stay for free while we're performing. We're Christians. Oh, wow. And at that time, God was already starting to call me, but, I, you know, I was, I just kept brushing it off. I had, a, uh, like, some verses with me, but again, I, I wasn't pursuing him. 
but God was definitely pursuing me, like almost every city where I was at, you're Christians. Yeah. And it's like God was telling me, you can't, you can't keep running away from me. Whether you're in China or Europe, wherever you go. Yeah. You're Amen. mine. <laughs> praise God. Amen. 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 Everybody praise God through that. Yes. Anything else? Anybody else? Things that really stood out in your mind where God was seeking to intervene and that came through a divine appointment with somebody? To me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in Florida. Um, I can't go into all the details, but I was living in a house down there and went to a supermarket and there was this lady and her son there and they were, you know, they gave me a Bible. You know, and I was all into Eastern stuff back then. Everything was Eastern. Went to a yoga community and met somebody, and they were my girlfriend. Uh, you know, like, you know, Eastern stuff was everything. Mm -hmm. So that was a divine appointment. That was the first time I remember anything specifically Christian breaking into my life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that went, but I felt, I felt touched by it, and I felt like something operating in me through it, but I didn't turn over my life then. Another time later down the road, um, after having moved to South Carolina for a summer with that same person that I was with, um, um, ended up um, going, I don't remember how this all worked, through some, some state. And these people came up to us while we were in a, in a mountain park and they were doing evangelizing. Mm -hmm. And this guy started telling me about Jesus and I told him, oh, you know, no, you know, I'm not into it. I want to hear how I'm a sinner and stuff like that. And um, it ended up, he said, I remember his words, amazing how God brings this stuff back. He said, I was sure God told, you know, told me he wanted me to speak to you. And, um, you know, I blew that off. And then later down the road, you know, when, every, when everything hit the fan, you know, God brings all this stuff back all the times, all the divine appointments. Amen. So there's a really heavy thing about divine appointments. I mean, looking at it on the side of the recipient, um, I, I felt, I'm just going to say, I feel tempted to say that probably 99% of divine appointments are turned down by people. Yeah. I mean, that that's my experience or feeling. Mm -hmm. And that when you do turn down a divine appointment, things really get hard for you after that. Yeah. So we don't know what goes on after the people say no. But mm -hmm. all I know is that after each time I did that, things took a downward turn pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Summer. I think it's crazy that out of all the college groups that in Tucson, God had you go to. Oh, yeah. The one that I was thinking about that because it was like, there's something real with this person. <laughs> I want to see what they're doing. Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> Yeah, you know, divine. So the thing to be said is that divine appointments are the most intense and um, impactful ministry, but they're also, like Lynn just said, often people don't have the eyes to see when God is reaching into their life to either keep them from making a very stupid, bad choice or to rescue them out of a situation. But, you know, the goodness of God is that he fills our life with uh, divine appointments. I mean, you know, on the day of judgment... Um, you know, people are going to probably appear before God and there's going to be thousands of instances uh, in their life where God really was reasoning with their heart and their soul to come to him. And um, even if their mind didn't have the awareness to see it, because people's minds can be so blinded by sin. Uh, but I even believe that if somebody's mind is rejecting what you're saying, God is still reasoning or working. In their spirit. Has everybody seen Allison's Choice yet, that pro life movie? No, the one that we have a lot of. It's on YouTube for free as well. But um, in, in the movie, there's this, um, it doesn't give anything away, but it's Jesus reaching into a young girl's life to reason with her to choose life. And in, the, in a moment, she's like, Why are you here for me? Like, why, why did you choose me? And then he opens her eyes and all of a sudden she can see him standing with all the other women in the waiting room and they're doing the exact same thing that she's doing to him, which is coming up with excuses why uh, they don't need to listen to him. So there's a very deep uh, thought there that God can be working on our souls, um, reasoning with us, even if our minds are so 
dead set on rejecting him that we don't see it, um, and, or that we choose not to see it, that we choose to turn a blind eye to the work of God in our life. I think now would be probably a good time for that, because it's at 25 minutes. So how to recognize them? Well, the first step is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And so that's easier said than done. But the way that you do that is to try to consciously be aware that God is with you when you're out and about. So does anyone here feel like they have the practice of doing that? Um, You know, that's the idea. The idea is to realize that God is with you um, and that he's calling you to step out. So try to consciously be aware that God is with you when you're out and about. Divine appointments can only happen around other people. So they can't happen um, at home, asleep, playing video games, uh, on the computer. They occur out in the world. So we have to put ourselves out there in order for for this type of ministry to occur. Um, Just like fishing doesn't happen away from the fish. So fishing only happens where there's fish. The same thing applies with divine appointments. You had a question, Barbara? No, I just find that before I go out, if I go shopping or anything, I just ask the Holy Spirit to guide me and give me the words to say, guide me who to speak to and when to speak it. Amen. So that would be a really good habit for everybody to incorporate. You know, um, there's everybody, we all are not for organized, um, you know, man-made tradition of religion, but it is okay to have religious uh, things in your life. So for example, you know, we, it's good to shower religiously in the sense that, you know, um, you shower consistently. It's good to uh, drink water religiously. You know, like you, anytime you're thirsty, you drink water. Well, you can make the same kind of uh, component, like, you know, anytime um, you're gonna go out, pray. You know, just say, Lord, I'm about to go out. Uh, Please use me. Please lead me. Please guide me. Help me to be aware of your presence. And it may take time to get used to to seeing God in your life like that. Um, But over time, if you persist, you'll become more and more sensitive to him. So thanks for sharing that, Barbara. Um, How to recognize them continued. The thing that makes a divine appointment different is the seemingly little amount of effort it takes to make it happen. So they're not situations that you're forcing to make happen. So for example, you may not go to the gas station to share the gospel, right? But um, you went for gas, God sent you to minister. So there's a crazy uh, example that I wish that, I, I so wish to God that we could have got this encounter on, um, on video. You know, I w- pray that the Lord someday brings in enough finances that we can have somebody that's just like with a video camera sometimes to switch it on. But Tess and I, it was like 12 o'clock at night. Um, we were driving from Waxahachie, Texas to um, north of Dallas. And it was last year on our ministry trip. And we stopped at a gas station in the middle of the night. And there was a guy with knee pads and... Um, he was the, the clerk for the gas station. And um, I, truthfully in my heart, cause it was so late and we had just had a huge storm in Waxahachie. Like we got, we were driving so late because the storm was so bad. You know, everybody, any monsoon we just had, like this storm was like two to three times worse than that. I kid you not. Like the place we were at, we were at an ice cream shop called Brahms and the, uh, Started it started flooding and the roof started leaking <laughs> and the, the wind was blowing the rain sideways. Yeah, so it, we could not drive in it. So we got really late that night. Um, we wanted to leave and get sleep because we we're leaving the next day. But what ended up happening was we go to this gas station and this guy's out there and he opens up a conversation with me. And I can't remember if he had a stutter at all. He may have had like a little stutter, but he... He started asking me, um, he asked me a really weird question, like about Babe Ruth. Um, he just opened up with like, you know, something about Babe Ruth. And I can't remember what I said um, in response to him in the moment, but I pretty much said, well, um, 
you know, with all of Babe Ruth's accomplishments, it, it didn't really mean anything if he didn't have Jesus Christ in his heart. And it opened up this long conversation. The guy was an eclectic. Like, he took from uh, Hinduism, he took from Buddhism, he took from Norse mythology. He, and every time, I mean, it was the craziest encounter, one of the craziest, every time he would say a holy name of anybody, he would get on his knees and uh, one knee and uh, kiss his hand and say, like, respect. <laughs> like, so just imagine 12 o'clock at night in the middle at a gas station, in the middle of North, like the guy would literally get down and he's like, you know, on his knee, respect. And, uh, yeah, so that he could bow down anywhere. And, he, and certain numbers were holy to him. But this guy was, thro- he was, he was not stupid. I mean, he was, at, he was, in, he knew a lot of information. This day at, we went to the school that I graduated from and they had free books. And I don't know why, but Tess and I grabbed a couple of the free books because libraries are always getting rid of books that aren't checked out because they need to make room for new ones. And I got a book on the Apostle Paul uh, and I was like, I don't know why I'm getting this thing, but um, you did. I didn't want it. We got a book. We got a book. I was like, no, we don't need more books. We have so many books. And Tess was like, let's do it. But then, no. But I think I said, you're like, well, we could put them back. And I was like, no, we'll, we'll take them. We'll just see what God wants to do with them. And we're at the gas station in the middle of the night. And the guy's just like, what about Hinduism? What about reincarnation? What about this? What about Norse mythology? What about this? And he's like, God is in my life. Like, there's a time where I was depressed. There's a time where I was suicidal. There's a time where somebody cheated on me. And he was sharing all of these different things. But it was like God literally kept surrounding him in the space. And... Um, he kept trying to dodge and dodge and dodge, and he couldn't, it's like he couldn't dodge. And um, finally, I mean, the guy was sadly very demonized, and certain numbers were holy to him. Like he'd say, like the number 13, and then get on this name, be like, oh. respect. Um, so, because he thought that it would somehow bless him. You know, there's certain things, I guess, in, you know, like numerology, where certain numbers, if you honor them, like somehow you'll get wealth. So, we ended up giving him um, this book on the Apostle Paul because he said he loved to read. And it was clear that he had read a lot because he just knew, he knew more information than the normal person. And um, he was just, he couldn't understand why he couldn't just approach God, why he needed Jesus. He may have grown up Catholic and just became open to everything. But that's an example of, you know, we were, we did not try to make it happen. I'm even like, Lord, please don't let this guy talk to us. Please don't let this guy talk to us. Lord, please, God, just let us get home because we still have another 30 minutes away and we're not, it's not even our home. We're staying with other people and we have to leave tomorrow and pack up. Lord, please. And the guy just out of nowhere, you know, he starts talking. And then uh, I bring up Jesus and he's, you know, he brings up, uh, you know, reincarnation. And I'm like, well, it's not true. And the one person that overcame death uh, was Jesus Christ and he said that there's a heaven and there's a hell. He wasn't reincarnated. So, you know, very powerful time and the guy got a book on Paul and it was a solid book on Paul. Uh, Good job Tess for choosing the book. Good job Holy Spirit for leading her to do it. Um, But it became clear, it was like, oh, well let's give this guy the book. and I don't know what's ever going to happen with him, but God confronted him that night, and every single one of his Amen. false ideas was shot down. Yeah, the grace of God was just so present. There's times mm-hmm. where, even for me, where it doesn't feel like, um, you know, a machine operating so smoothly. It was like, you know, everything felt just point, counterpoint, God was wow. present. So some of the things, uh, some of the signs, sorry that that says, uh, saying some of the signs that God is setting up a divine appointment, openness. So when somebody shows openness, um, you know, that's important to recognize. Friendliness, when somebody is acting extra friendly, pay attention. People are not that friendly, especially people <laughs> that are into themselves. Consistent contact, and what I mean by that is if you're at the store, or you're out and um, you pass by them and you see them again, you know, not to try to make it silly, but you know, like in the Matrix, like uh, when the cat goes by and it's a deja vu, uh, meant something in the Matrix. When you go by somebody and God tugged on your heart and you felt like you're supposed to do something and you missed it, 
and then five minutes later, ten minutes later, they're back in front of you. Take note of that. Like, there's a reason God is making, God is, is ultimately in charge of our lives if we're living for him. And so if he's setting our steps in a way that we run into somebody again, um, Tess and I had an encounter like that in D.C. We're on a walking path. I shared it before. Um, it was last summer. We're walking. See a couple arguing. Oh, Lord, we got to get, we got to finish our walk. Sadly, you know, that's because we had a, a literal um, dinner appointment. So we didn't feel free to stop because we were meeting other people. It wasn't just for our sake. If it was for our sake, we wouldn't have felt the burden to not stop um, or the burden to stop. So we, we walk and a couple minutes later, we have to turn around to make it back in time. And um, we see the couple, we hear some crying or we hear crying actually. And we're speeding up our walking because we're thinking we got to get back. We have to get back in time. We don't want to make the people that are hosting us feel like we're disrespecting their time. And God's just like, you got to go back. You got to go back. And I'm like, Lord, um, Tess is walking even extra fast now. Like that <laughs> must be a sign that you don't want us to go back. And I look at her and I say, well, let's just pray for that couple. And she says, I've been praying since we passed them. And when that happened, it was like, God just said, see, um, you got to go back. And I was like, okay, Lord, I don't care if the people are bothered. You're setting up a divine appointment. You're about to do something here. And it was a powerful time. And the girl, um, you know, was sharing about suicidal thoughts and how she had just cried out to God asking for help. Um, her boyfriend could not help her because she was not a Christian. Uh, because he was not a Christian, she was not a Christian. She grew up going from Catholic to Christian, but she didn't understand anything about the gospel. So in that kind of situation, consistent contact, you got to take note of it. You know, you go to one end of the store and you just feel like, oh man, I was supposed to share with that person. Start saying, Lord, you know, if you want me to share with them, bring me in touch with them again. And if you do have that consistent contact and you didn't get it the first time, take it as a sign the second time. Even though you don't act initially, um, it still ends up happening. And by that, I mean a divine appointment is almost something that you can't really get away from. So you try to, maybe you go your own way and God still makes it happen. Realize, okay, it's a divine appointment, similar to consistent contact. We just had that encounter on Sunday and we shared about that on um, Sunday night, but we were at food city after church and there was a girl that God was highlighting in my mind to share the gospel with. And I was like, oh, I don't know, like, God, it's probably not the most appropriate for me to because she's a younger girl, she's a teenager, um, but started praying. And I was like, Lord, if you bring it up to Tess, I'll know that you are calling us to do this. And we're near the oranges, Tess comes over and she says, uh, I think God wants me to talk to that girl. Uh, she keeps staring at me in the eyes. So she, yeah, she kept making eye contact with me. Yeah. I was like, what and are so, you looking at me? And so when that, <laughs> so happened, when that happened, when that happened, right after she said eyes. that, immediately <laughs> after Tess said that, the girl came up around the other side of the oranges, she starts really picking up oranges. Exactly. And she's well, like... Well, I was still in the middle of my sentence. Yeah. Like, it's before I had even... She's like, so what are the prices of these oranges? <laughs> okay, so, and believe it or not, we're still ministering to her. Yeah. Uh, Tess is ministering to her through Instagram, and it's been a lot of good interactions and encounters. She grew up going to Catholic church, goes to Catholic high school, getting pulled by the world, but still at a place of some innocence and purity. Um, so it's like God is literally intervening in her life before she gets messed over because she's only, I think, 16 um, or 15. Feeling So if you feel the spiritual weightiness of an encounter, take, take that as a sign that it's a divine appointment. And what, by that I mean if you start feeling like I got to do this and you start feeling like the space is heavy and you start feeling like your hair is a little standing up um, because you're nervous, Take, take into consideration that God is um, making something happen. And I've had encounters like that. I haven't had as many encounters with people that have influence as I once did because here in Tucson, nobody of influence is here. But when I would go to Washington, D.C. and go to different events, sometimes God would give me the opportunity to meet like a couple of famous people every now and then. There's a, 
a woman named Kirsten Powers who went from being like a liberal atheist to then going to Tim Keller's church, but sadly she converted to Catholicism. But before she converted to Catholicism, I actually, after the event uh, that she spoke at, this big dinner, I was able to, and not dinner like our Sunday night dinner, dinner like fancy <laughs> speaker, this is my book dinner. Um, she, I got to share with her about this book called Not a Fan. I was like, you know, and I shared the gospel with her and I'm kind of very, I was like, you know, it's really all about being a follower of Jesus Christ. Like and following him wherever he calls you to go because she had just quote unquote converted. I felt very nervous, but I knew that the spiritual weightiness of that encounter um, was really important. There's, I told her that, uh, that it was really all about being a follower of Jesus Christ and following him wherever he told her to go. Like literally laying everything at Jesus' feet and saying, okay, God, I follow you, deny myself. She was just cordial. Um, but I got to talk to her for a few minutes. Do you remember Kirsten Powers, uh, news? Yeah, and some of the other news stations. You know, she's pretty much a flaming liberal. Is she really? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, she became more neutral. She was neutral. So. Oh yeah, so there's Matt Walsh is a famous uh, conservative blogger, and um, he has commentator. He has a lot of followers, definitely in the high hundreds of thousands, and writes books and things like that. But um, I was at an event that he was speaking at, and God put it on my heart. Um, Why well, I didn't get to talk to him the first time, and. At these multi-day events, you know, you go to a hotel and the speakers have to come into the hotel as well. And it was at the end of the day and I think he was leaving and um, I was maybe leaving at that time too. And I just felt like the Lord said um, to me the night before, if you see Matt Walsh, like talk to him about depression. And I was like, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll go for it. And when he was there in the, in the um, lobby, I went up to him. And we had a long conversation. He's Catholic, so I started kind of going after Catholicism um, and trying to say, "Hey, you know, it's not, it's not true, and it's not, it's not the real thing." And um, didn't have too much um, ability to to get through to him there. But I, I said, "You know, last night I really felt like the Lord told me that I was going to see you today and to talk to you about depression, and that you know." Do you struggle with depression? And he was shocked. He was like, yeah. Uh, he was like, but, but then he covered it really quick. He said, um, but maybe it's just the normal depression that all humans go through. You know, that's like what people that are depressed, that are intellectual always try to do. Like everybody feels this depressed. They just cover it over because being in this messed up world makes you depressed and you have existential problems because you're human. But, the, um, you know, it was like a divine appointment. Um, so... These type of things play roles in the, in the lives of the people that we meet and minister to. Yes, did Summer. Did you run into Lauren Daigle too? I did run into Lauren Daigle. <laughs> That's true. I used to run into a lot of people whenever, I, and Andrew ran into Bill Johnson and oh, yeah. and huh? And Rick Warren. I didn't get to challenge Rick Warren. No, you didn't get to challenge him. Not you cross paths. Yeah. Heidi Baker. I did get to challenge Heidi Baker. <laughs> I didn't even know as much. Yeah. So, you know, it's like God can set, set up divine appointments. Uh, yeah, Lauren Daigle, a friend of, of mine named Brandon, was with the, in D.C. with me at the time. And we walked by her, and this is before her kind of like apostasy and uh, lukewarmness and um, just like everything's all good Christianity. But we... She came by and, and her band or whoever she was with, manager, was like, no, we can't stop to talk. I was like, let me pray for you. And she was like, okay. And we just, we actually prayed that God would help her not to compromise. But sadly, I was like, Lord, you know, when I was seeing all the things that she was doing in, um, a year or two ago, I was like, Lord, did we not pray hard enough <laughs> for her? But, um, well, you prayed the right thing. Yeah, I prayed. Yeah. I know. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, I should have prayed longer. <laughs> That's you get. You just got to get somebody's hand and pray for them. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, there is also a time in D.C. I guess the thing is in Tucson, it's just, Tucson is like a backwater town, sadly. But in D.C., you know, people that are trying to influence everything are there, so you inevitably run into, run into them. There's a Muslim unity, like unite people, the secular and the Muslim, um, and they, I got to like share the gospel with one of the conference organizers and some of their interns and stuff with some of the people at the time that I was with in D.C., um, just from walking around. Um, so divine appointments, you gotta, you gotta recognize them. And when you feel the weighty, so all of those encounters had a, a very intense spiritual weightiness. So I felt like I have to, I have to share the gospel. Uh, I have to, to have this encounter. Um, eye contact is another big thing. Take note when people are doing things that normal Americans don't do. So what, do, what to do? So once you, the divine appointment has started, what to do? Well, this is very important. Very often there can be demonic resistance. So you got to begin to pray. Begin to rebuke any spirits in the person's life by praying in your heart and your spirit. Not verbally, if there are a lot of people around. So there's times where if there's not a lot of people around, literally begin to, to pray. You can even pray out loud. God, I just invite you here right now. God, just have your way here. With Isaiah, who came to church on the park on Sunday, you know, I was praying, God, just come and be here, Lord. Just help me, Lord. If you want me to minister to Isaiah, help me to, to make it happen. And then it was like, I went to go do it. And it, all of a sudden, two employees are surrounding him. And I'm like, Lord, okay, God, you know, will you open the door? Will you, will you make it happen? Because um, I believe God will make it clear. So there's a place where you don't have to live with a weird level of um, burden. With this, so for example, you know, if you need to get somewhere, I don't think God is going to lead you to somebody that's busy for 10 minutes and you're just going to be sitting there like, okay, Lord, I'm, like, I'm just here waiting for 10 minutes for the, these people to get done. That kind of thing is not a divine appointment. So, but you, you need to pray if there's something like that that happens because God can move the people or open up the space again if it's his will to, to make the ministry occur. But, um... That, that, I would say, is very important. As we're talking about divine appointments, don't feel the burden to feel like every single thing is a divine appointment. Otherwise, you'll be, you'll be at Walmart and you're like, Lord, like I should talk to the cash register woman, but there's like 10 people in line. And then, you know, you wait and it's like, okay, there's 10 more people in line. This is, you know, this is, this is not, you know, it's not happening the right way. So in that kind of situation, you may have to just say, okay, Lord, like I just put this person in your hands. Um, Divine appointments are where, see, it's where God is making it kind of easy. It's like God is putting the neon signs and saying, like, I want you to talk to this person. I'm creating space for you to do it. But still begin to pray. If you're with another believer, voice out what you're thinking. So with Tess, um, she voiced it out, and that gave me confirmation. And I voiced it to her. And then we looked at each other, and we thought, it's time. Same thing in the encounter that we had in Washington, D.C., and other encounters that we've had as well. Uh, there's not even time to, to go into how many different encounters like that have occurred. Um, but it's important to voice, that, voice it out. So this will give you added confirmation because if the Holy Spirit is telling the person that you're with without you talking um, to do something, then both of you are hearing the Holy Spirit. So recognize that. You know, when God says uh, to one person, hey, this person uh, that's in front of you should be shared with, and you guys don't, the person you're with, uh, you guys aren't talking, hey, maybe we should talk to that person, that person, and God tells them the same thing, it's important to voice it out. Hey, I felt like God was just telling me the same thing. Oh, wow, really? God was telling me that too. Then you know God is actually setting something up. Um, so supernatural movements. Very often God is operating and Satan is, opera in, is in operation. I'm sorry that this has some, um, some mistakes. Very often God is operating and Satan is operating at the same time. Do you feel nervous? Do you feel hindered? Suddenly tired? Suddenly lazy? Suddenly scared? It can be the enemy's attempts to dissuade you from obeying God. If you recognize any of the above... Resist it. So if all of a sudden out of nowhere you feel, oh, I don't want to do anything, and you weren't feeling that before, oh, I'm so tired. 
or distracted, realize that that could very well be, and most likely is a supernatural movement of what the devil's doing in ways that you can't perceive in the physical to try to hinder you from what, obeying God and participating in what God wants to do in that moment. So you have to resist it. So that's why the first key is to always pray. you got to pray. God literally honors the invoking of his name when we have faith in him. And that's an important thing to understand. So that's why I do it all the time. And we have to literally have faith. You have to believe. I mean, people like Elijah, people like Elisha, Peter, Paul, the disciples, David in the Bible. Um, when they called out to God in situations, they knew God was listening. So in a situation where you're ministering, invoke his name, bring him into the, into the place. We actually uh, had a powerful thing happen at Planned Parenthood the other day that some of us here were witnesses to. But there's a guy that was in a car, took his girlfriend there for birth control or something. Um, at least that's what he said. He would not, but he would not talk to us. Um, he dropped her off and then came back a couple minutes later. And he rolled down his windows and he had his music on, not, to, not so loud that it really hindered us, but sometimes he would turn his music off. So I, I, I was preaching at him. Slavic was preaching at him. We were, we were kind of almost like preaching to pester him, not like in a mean, antagonistic way, but we're his, he was in a Chevy Malibu, and we're like, come on, Chevy Malibu, come out, of the, come out and talk to us. You know, God wants, God's seeking to reach you today. Why don't you want to talk to us? This is the day where God's going to change your life. Come and talk to us. And then we would start preaching the gospel. People, you know, maybe you're avoiding God. You know, you, you could very well be in sin. You could be headed towards destruction. And the fact that you won't talk to us means that you, you most likely are in a place where you're, you are just totally separated from God. And uh, you may think that you're right with God. You may think that you grew up Catholic or this or that. And then eventually, um, while we were praying and we were singing and doing things like that, and there was a woman that pulled it next to him that was there for birth control. And she was like, I'm Catholic. I'm just here for birth control. And he looked when she said Catholic and then Tess kind of yelled out, uh, how about you, uh, Chevy Malibu? Are you Catholic too? And uh, somehow, like not long after that, after about an hour of us being there praying, praying for him, we were praying for him too, out loud. Lord, help, help Chevy Malibu. Uh, help him, Lord. Help the guy in the car, God. He's not right with you. Soften his heart, Lord. Soften his heart. We believe you're going to do it. And an hour and a half later, he actually came out and he was, he was smiling. He's like, or he opened his window and stuck his head out. He's like, okay, I got some questions. Why are you here? <laughs> yeah. And then, and we told him about abortion and then we told him about the gospel, and he was like, you should open up with the gospel. People will be more receptive to, uh, like, than abortion. <laughs> and we're like, well, that's what we, we do. Um, and he had a lot of good questions, believe it or not. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't just being a jerk. He wasn't messing around with us. He was asking questions like, well, what, is, what do you think God's definition of love is? What's your definition of love? And um, we were helping, it seemed like we were helping him understand some things. And, and then yeah, Tess got to share with him that he had to be born again, that being Catholic wasn't good enough. And he admitted he was in sin. Wow. And he admitted that he wasn't right with God and that he was only right with God when things got really hard at times. So that's never a good sign. When somebody says they're right with God when things are hard, that means that when finances are tight, they're like, God, help me. And that's even one of the, the issues, um, you know, with Jonathan Rumi's testimony, the guy that plays Jesus, like he, he surrendered to God when he was like, God, I have too many bills. I'm $100 overdrawn. Okay, I've been trying to work and do all this. I surrender. What do you want from me? Instead of the real, a real, you know, conversion experience deals with more than surrender. It deals with um, kind of an inner accounting of your sin before God and how you where you are came through choices where you were rebelling against God and rejecting him. So, you know, a lot of people will say, when things get hard, I'm right with God. And what they really mean is, like when they're in a bind, then they turn to God. We even ministered to a girl at Planned Parenthood that was sharing um, how a year or two ago when her uncle was about to die, she like cried out to God and then asked God to forgive her for her sins. 
um, to save her uncle. So, you know, people do this inner bargaining where it's like, okay, God, I'm ready. I'll turn to you. Please forgive me of my sins. Please heal my uncle. And uh, she did say that her, her uncle survived. But um, nevertheless, she, she hadn't um, really, she didn't understand the gospel. Uh, it's kind of just like, a, you know, people do a long shot at times. Like, let me just see if anything will work. So, it's like God is their last resort. Right. Yeah, yeah instead so of their first option. Exactly. God literally honors the invoking of His name when we have faith in Him. When we invite Him to take charge of the situation, He does it. So it's vital to do this in every situation of our lives. Divine appointments are opportunities for God. One, to strengthen our faith. So every time you have a divine appointment in your life, it strengthens your faith. The second, it shows us the physical movements of what's occurring supernaturally. That's very important because God does desire that we become more attuned to him supernaturally. And when you see him work in a divine appointment, what it does is it shows you that physical things uh, are shifting when supernatural things are occurring. Just like prayer. I mean, everybody, everybody at Planned Parenthood, out of all of us the other day, had to be thinking like, that's incredible. Yeah. Like, that's incredible. Um, because the guy would not talk to us for anything. He just ignored us, ignored us, ignored us. And then finally, after bringing in God, singing songs to the Lord so much, something changed in the atmosphere. And even it was like something changed by having Jesus lifted up in this girl's life that we were talking to that was there concerning birth control. And she, we shared the gospel with her. And it was like having a heart that was receptive to the gospel seemed to break something out of the space and, and make make the entire place really more uplifted. Yes, yeah, so reminds me of like the other guy in the Jeep whose girlfriend was like a witch or something and she went, this was like months ago. Yeah. And he was like all angry at preaching out of his music blaring and he goes and he takes off like the top of his Jeep Jeep and he takes his Jeep apart. But as he as you're like talking to him, I just have this strong feeling that he was like convicted in what we were doing and uh, preaching to him and singing worship songs, just doing something in the spiritual realm. Yeah, he ended up taking out a Polaroid camera, taking a photo of us, and was like, I like you guys. Um, but that's all he said. <laughs> So, and then it's a, it's a blessing to have the Lord minister through us. So that's the other powerful thing that occurs. So what to do? So the approach. Sometimes God may have the person approach you, but not always. So, for example, the other day, the girl approached us. God literally set, it, set the stage for us. He said, here you go. Uh, you don't have to do any work. You just have to be here. Um, but if not, you approach. So don't expect God to just make the person approach all the time. Be relaxed and confident. So what I mean by that is consciously trust God. Open the conversation. Well, let me go. I, I think actually we're going to go into what I was thinking we weren't. But open the conversation. How are you doing? Uh, that's a good, can be a good just opener. Say, I felt like God wanted me to share something. Um, with you or share with you and sometimes it's good to just continue initially to say I felt like God wanted me to share with you don't don't wait you know just say this and this and this and this or you know I felt like God wanted me to ask you where where are you at with Jesus do you believe in Jesus are you following Jesus has anyone told you how Jesus died for you um, and so it's good to kind of have a intro where you're going continually there can be the initial conviction um, and presence of the Holy Spirit as God speaks through you. So you don't want to kind of muffle it, muffle that or, or miss it by kind of saying like, oh, how are you doing? And then, you know, how are you doing? Oh, good. You know, like the weather today? Yeah. Like the weather today. You know, you want to say, if you're going to open with how are you doing? How are you doing? I felt God wanted me to share with you. Or, you know, how are you doing? Okay, I feel pretty good. Or if they say, oh, I'm horrible, something bad's happening, well, now you know even more that the Holy Spirit's at work. But you don't want it to come into this familiarity of conversation. So be bold. When God gives you a great opportunity, seize the opportunity. Seize it. Don't hold back. Invoke Jesus Christ quickly. And that may seem um, Simple, but no, like literally bring in the name of Jesus because there's power in the name of Jesus. 
Break every chain to break every chain, break every chain. <laughs> Power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, every chain, every chain. Um, so when you open up the conversation, you know, it's actually better to say, um, you know, rather than like, oh, I feel like there's something that I'm supposed to share with you. I feel like Jesus Christ put something on my heart to share with you. You know, bring in his name, his authority, because his authority and his name is the name above every name on heaven and on earth. So even if they don't believe it, you're bringing in like the mountain uh, of God into the space. Where if you kind of keep it in generalities, like, I felt like I was supposed to share something with you. Like, stay positive, you know, be happy. You know, people sometimes get, in, especially in the charismatic, get into weird, you know, like God maybe just wants me to, to do this little like subtle, subtle like movement here or there. No, God, God can do that, but He very often, if it's going to be real and have impact, it's going to deal with real topics and real issues. And speak with authority. Gauge how they're responding. Are they open? Is there a war going on in their soul? Have they shared anything with you that would be abnormal for a stranger to share? So, for example, this girl the other day. We asked her, have you ever prayed and asked Jesus, you know, to come into your life? And I think she said something about, like, she started praying recently because she was having trouble with friends. Well, it's like, whoa, okay, God is setting something up here. Um, you need to be aware of where they're at just because it will help you proceed in the conversation. So the conversation has started. There can be a temptation to fall short. And by that I mean... You know, you kind of step out and you share for 20 or 30 seconds and then it's like, run away, I feel good. That was great. Like, I did it. Praise the Lord. And there can be a time where people will fail uh, and fall short, but that's a temptation to fall short. I mean, when you are in a divine appointment, you want to stand like solid in the Lord and you don't want to, you don't want to walk away. And there's even been times with bad encounters where I felt like God said, don't walk away. There's a time in... In Houston, um, well, actually, Gaveston, which is south of Houston, um, I was on the beach and sharing the gospel with a guy. A girl, his, his fiance, girlfriend, or whoever, comes up and starts cussing at me and the person I'm with. And the people that I was with had no real experience sharing the gospel. So they, they bailed. Um, and they were also scared at the time. Um, they were... Some, a couple of them, had made, one of them had maybe been um, migrated from part of Africa, and the other one um, was African as well. And they had fear that because they were two white people and a woman, you know, cursing, that it would be misconstrued, like, racially, and that, you know, they just had racial concerns um, in Galveston, because especially um, when all the stuff was happening, it was... You know, more intense and people were. No, the woman was white, like Irish Catholic. Oh, and they were. Black. And they were black, and so they had the concern. But uh, I told them, like, no, like sometimes you just have to stand your ground when God is is there. So, for example, this woman was like, "Get out, get out of here!" And we're on public beach, and I said, "I'm not getting out of here." She's cursing at me, and I, so I just started rebuking her, and I'm like. No, you're going to be the one that leaves because I have a right to be here and the demons that are in you are going to have to, you're, they're going to have to leave. And uh, so she just, you know, walked away cussing me out and everything. But there's a time. See, even that was a divine appointment. Like her husband heard the gospel and his friend and then she started hearing the gospel and um, she, she realized that she was dealing with the Lord. Like God's not going to cower and back down to people cursing. Now, I'm not telling you to be stupid, like if it's, but there was no, vi no violence was going to occur. Uh, the husband thought that his wife was acting crazy. Everybody thought that was in the tent thought that she was acting crazy. I mean, she was demonically manifesting. So in a situation like that, you know, you stand firm in the Lord and um, that's when it's a bad encounter. But when it's a good encounter, the temptation can be, you know, to get out of there um, after you just maybe kind of share some of the, only some of the things that God wants shared. So, for example, this girl that we talked with the other day, 
we could have easily shared the gospel with her and, and left, but I realized her grandma was still shopping. So, hey, I don't care if it's awkward. We're going to start asking her more and more questions. You know, um, what, what's it that's keeping you from surrendering to God? Oh, my friends, I have friendships, and they're not, you know, right in the Lord. And um, how about boys? You know, no, I'm not really uh, being affected by, like, relationships with boys right now. And we just kept sharing and sharing and sharing and sharing and sharing and sharing, which is why Andrew ended up calling, like, where are you guys? <laughs> are you guys going to be here soon? Because it was on Sunday. And, but the point is, you don't want to end a conversation in 30 seconds that maybe God wanted to go for 10 minutes. And so that's the thing. And even if it's bad, you don't want, you don't want, uh, the same thing. Like there was a guy that was at a pho restaurant that Andrew and I went to, and he started cussing me out uh, when I brought the gospel up. And I just said, "Well, why do you hit?" You know, rather than run away and say, "Oh, why well, gave him the gospel?" I said, "Well, why do? You, why are you so angry? You know, why are you such?" A, and suddenly he like wasn't as angry, and um, got to share the gospel and actually got to the issue homosexuality. I said, "There." God's telling me there had, has to be something in your life. Because he said, I used to be a Jesus freak, this and that. I said, there has to be something in your life where you weren't um, okay with what the Bible said. And this is why you don't want to believe that the Bible has any truth. And he was like, uh, well, I'm homosexual. And I said, okay, well, if that's the one thing that's going to lead you to hell, you need to give that thing up and repent of it. Because that could be the very one thing that leads you to hell. But divine appointment, see... In this encounter, I could have thought, oh man, this guy's cursing. I already tried to give him a gospel tract. He didn't want it. Well, unless it's dangerous, if you don't feel in the Lord like there's any danger. I knew this was not going to be dangerous. The guy was like in his 60s. If it's somebody that, that's young, they look like they're high or drunk or on meth. You know, I wouldn't say to have the same approach, but when you are... You're confident that God has you in a, in a place to share the gospel. Don't fall short for the full thing that God wants to do. And that can be for both good and bad encounters. Start looking out for distractions if you're able to, um, and if you're able, pray against it. So distractions. Different distractions can come from different places. There's three types of distractions. Visual distractions, manual distractions, which mean um, handheld and cognitive. So some visual distractions are distractions where a uh, cell phone starts going off. You know, that's a distraction. Um, people will start yelling nearby. That's a distraction. Siren starts going off. That's a distraction. Baby starts crying nearby. Distraction. Manual distraction is something like kid, kid in the hands. And sometimes that can be a serious distraction. You know, where like a baby is like squirming and all of a sudden they get uncomfortable. And we've had it actually where people will ask their spouse or somebody else, hold the baby, and they'll still talk to us. So that's, yeah. a, that's a, when that happens, it's an added sign that God's really moving in that moment. Um, mm -hmm. People will sometimes say, oh, my kid, restless, and sometimes all you can do at that point is let them go because you can't force them to stay. Um, cognitive distractions, that's where people are struggling to maybe deal with the concepts that you're talking about. So try to know if you have their undivided attention or if they have responsibilities. So responsibilities are kids, spouse, people around. But if there's one thing to understand, it's never feel nervous or bad for holding someone up in their day or timing. Because mm -hmm. there's always that temptation like, oh, they really got to go. I got to stop talking. They got to go. Like I got to finish up. No, like until they... Until they got to go and say, I'm done, don't feel bad. Uh, don't feel bad for people uh, that they're making um, wait for them either. Because the truth is, it's far more important that the person in front of you encounter God than the person uh, waiting for them get home to watch Netflix or get food. And that's the God's honest truth. I mean, we're dealing with spiritual things. Uh, care, that's where... If that kind of stuff starts to happen, you just need to speak the truth. I care about this person's eternal soul. This person could die and go to hell, Amen. or they could yes. end up in eternity in heaven, and I could play a role in this. I don't want to fall short and blow it here. So, you know, blow in love, blowing it is like, you know, the person is getting a call, and they're like, 
I'm going to have to go soon. Oh, you should just go. Like, or, or, okay, I don't really know where to go with this. I don't have enough time. No. In love, demand their attention because it's much more important. Unless, somebody, <laughs> unless somebody's dying on the other end of the line or, um, you know, it's something crazy. It's like it's more important for them to hear the truth. So recognize if there are exter external distractions. Even while you're ministering, recognize it. I try to multitask while I minister. I try to realize, huh, like baby's crying right now. Kids are getting restless. Recognize if there are internal distractions. This person is spacing out. What's going on? Why are they spacing out? Your focus can actually help the other person to focus. So be focused and it will help them to focus. Keep eye contact. One of the most important things to do is to keep eye contact. Speak from your heart and your gut more than your head. So that's something that we, sh we could all even go through, but there's a difference between a head voice and a gut voice, and that's actually a thing in singing and a thing in public speaking. And people don't like to listen to head voices. I mean, unless they're acting a part, you know, nobody really likes... Um, a head voice. Now, if somebody cannot help it with their voice, I, I don't think that that's a problem. But you want to speak from your heart and your gut because that's when people see that, they're like, this person really, they have conviction. Um, where the head can kind of be flighty. Speak with passion. Speak like the, the person's life depends on it. So include the gospel, and we're coming to a close soon. Have a, goal, a full gospel presentation ready you don't want to just be kind of like oh this is a divine appointment and then like oh what do i do lord you know what if, where do i go with this even if god gives you a word of knowledge where god says hey i tell that person you know that they're struggling with depression or tell that person you know x y or z yeah. you want to have a gospel presentation ready and not just um have it be a divine appointment that doesn't really go anywhere ask them a few questions see how they respond have you given your life to jesus do you believe in jesus has anyone shared with you about what jesus did for you on the cross very similar things so this is where all the other evangelism training comes in at this moment you bring all these questions in share the gospel usually god will make it clear after you share as to why god made the encounter happen sometimes the person will say like, I just literally started praying recently. Or, oh man, something really bad just happened. Or, um, or they won't tell you. And maybe they're feeling convicted. And they just won't tell you. Pray for the person. I always say in a divine appointment, if you can pray for the person, or even get them to pray with you, try to make it happen. Try to get them to, to pray for them. And if they're open... Uh, and you can even do this in prayer. And I'm not talking about like a salvation sinner's prayer unless it's God setting that up. But try to get them to pray and, uh, you know, even just say like, will you pray this with me? Jesus, will you work in my life? Will you show me who you are? Will you help me to come into a relationship with you the way that you want me to? Um, I think that kind of thing is fine. I think that that's even much better than a sinner's prayer because it kind of distinguishes between salvation and just um, open line of communication. Good, it's great for people literally to pray to God in honesty and sincerity that he would reach into their life, even if they don't fully grasp uh, the gospel or have been born again. Because how is it going to happen? It's not going to happen through them. I mean, it's going to happen through God at work in their life. So if salvation, coming to a place of salvation is going to happen in their future, all of this plays a role. You know, they responded to God. They said, God, yeah, I want, it. I want you at work in my life. I want you to reveal yourself to me. Trade contact info with the person. If it's a divine appointment, I can't stress this enough. Try to trade contact info with the person. Do it, even if they ghost you, which people can do. And then always try to follow up. And don't hesitate to reach out quickly. Have resources ready, saved in a phone note. So, for example... Um, there are go-to videos that we use. When I meet somebody, I'll immediately send them my false conversion video at times, or Eric Luddy, the gospel, um, or whatever the topic. So if it's a Mormon, Bible versus uh, Joseph Smith, or if it's um, you know somebody that's into New Age stuff, I'll, I'll send them a New Age testimony. Or if it's somebody 
that's into um, whatever the topic may be. You know, it's like you want to have a couple things that are your go-to already in your phone, so you can just immediately, boom, send it. And uh, like the resurrection, resurrection video that I have, you know, immediately, okay, hey, I made this video on the resurrection. It proves why Jesus rose from the dead. Would you be able to watch it? Would you want to watch it? It's good to follow up because then you're getting more um, contact with the person. And then you can really see what's going to happen with the divine appointment. So, for example, the girl sent Tess a very long uh, question. And then Tess sent her back a very long answer. And Tess is like, I hope she responds. And then she, she responded back. And Tess responded back. You know, Tess shared a video. She's like, okay, I'll watch it. Um, so, that can... It's like God compounds the divine appointment. So what happens if you have bad encounters? So the first thing, yeah, Tony. Do you have, do you have like a file you can send us of, of videos? Yeah, maybe we should make a Google Drive that has... My resources page has a lot of videos on it. Do you want to take videos? I mean, I can do it myself, but it would take a lot of time. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah, we could have a Google Drive that just has... Also, So, bad encounter, don't worry. God can turn lemons into lemonade. You never know how God will work after you. Mm -hmm. So, God is not dependent upon just you. He can work after the encounter, and He will. You may be stepping, you may be this stepping stone in um, that person's life, in, in their life. In this person's life, you might be like a stepping stone. Maybe a couple more steps, and they'll be. With the, you know, open to to the Lord, I felt like that happened in Jose's life. You know, he he literally told me on the phone one day, "I'm not ready." And then a few months later, somebody else came into his life, and he was more ready. Um, but it was all stepping into that place. If they reject you or curse you, praise the Lord. Uh, you obeyed God, and one day they will remember the person that cared enough to stop and challenge them about Jesus. So with all that being said, that completes our, our training for the night. Mm. You have a question or a thought? Um, just two thoughts. Um, just to add, share, if it's okay. Um, it can be very, oh, yeah, a divine appointment can be very uncomfortable. Mm. Like you brought up, there could be different factors going on. So... Being uncomfortable doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to do it. Mm. As a matter of fact, God might be making you uncomfortable enough to let you know that he really wants you to do it. Mm. Yeah. So that's one thing. And just one second. Um, and if you miss the divine appointment, there's timing going on at times with the divine appointment, like you brought up with an employee. And then if you don't move right at the moment God tells you to, it's uncanny how I've been, I've went through so many of these things through the years. It seems like somebody will come or, and take them away. Mm -hmm. you know, like if somebody in a store or something, I don't know, it's working there and you feel like to say something, and God's telling you just go ahead or you know, yeah. reach out and give them a bill. All of a sudden somebody will come out of the back and they'll start talking to them and all of a sudden they'll call them and they'll be walking in the back and then you're standing there going, do I wait, what do I do? So timing, because God is perfect, can be a big factor. Although, like you said, God can bring it around and make it happen again, I found that in most of my experiences, you either do it when God tells you or you miss the opportunity. Yeah. So it's just the way God trains you to be sensitive to him. Amen. So that's one other thing. And then the other one other thing that you brought up was about cutting ministry short. Um, another reason why people, why you're going to tend to cut ministry short is because you come to a place where you're both in agreement. And that's great. That builds like bridges, that builds like a little foundation. To, to, but it's a foundation that God builds for you to go to the next thing he wants you to do. And so you may, I, I've done it. You just say, okay, now's a good time to end while, we, while, everybody, your head. while everybody feels good. Yeah. Like you didn't hit anything that God really wanted hit. Right. But you don't want to really get into their thing. So you kind of let it go where you're at. And that, that, so every time when you kind of miss the word, it makes you feel kind of funny. Yeah. And you know you feel funny. 
and it's not like God wants you under condemnation, but it's part of the training where God knows how to make you feel just uncomfortable enough that he captures your attention uh, to not do the same thing in the future, but to yeah. act. Mm -hmm. when he, I call it a prompting. God prompts you, and he's mm -hmm. like nudging you. Mm -hmm. And when you get that prompting and you begin to recognize this is, this is how God lets me know, yeah. then you just surrender to it. Because if you don't, and you don't do it, you're mm -hmm. probably going to be miserable. You're going to be mm -hmm. going over it in your head. <sighs> The devil's going to be telling you you should have done it. Yes. You're going to be telling yourself, oh, I should have done it. And you just feel miserable. Yeah. So I, that's the way God trained me by letting me feel miserable when I didn't do what he wanted me to just do. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody have any questions? Any? Two different instances. Um, the car broke down. I, well, I had a vehicle broke down and I needed to be towed. Um, both on a Sunday, interesting enough. Um, and I got the same AAA driver twice. Wow. Twice in a row. Yeah. And I, I, I shared with him the first time and then um, I got to talk to him a little bit more the second time. Um, he hadn't really been going to church, but I mean, at least I got it in his mind the second time. So. Yeah. Amen. Was that recent? The second one was recent. The second one was just when I got a flat tire a couple weeks ago. And it was the same guy? Same, same driver, yeah. From when? When was it the first one? The first one was probably after, just, a couple, just a few months ago. Yeah, just, uh, after Scottsdale. Yeah, right after my sister's wedding. Wow. So just a few mm -hmm. months ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll pray. Yes. Lord, we thank you for the evening. God, yes, we just Lord. pray that you would bless everybody's evening and their night. Mm -hmm. God, yes, we thank Lord. you for the time. Lord, we do pray for divine appointments. God, yes, please, Lord, yes, give them to Lord. us, God. Amen. Make us hungry for them, Lord. Yes, Put an appetite in us and a desire for divine appointments, God. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, feed them to us, Lord, in the name of yes. Jesus. That we would yes, we'd literally Lord. have divine appointments and that we would have encounters with people that are really good in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God.